Welcome back. This is the first session in the Packet Pushers live stream. So we're talking about a customer use case story who found the Glueware product and what they did. I'm speaking with Julie Whirling. She's a solutions architect over at Glueware. And we're talking about how this financial company was able to achieve continuous compliance for the global financial network on their existing technology. No new, no refurbishment, no throwing everything out, starting again. So Julie, let's get straight into the topics that we wanted to discuss today. Now, what was it that originally drove them to start talking to Glueware? What was their initial need. Hi, Greg. So the first use case for this, this key client of using Glueware was to do OS upgrades. So they had recently um, looked at Glueware because they needed to, they know they needed to get their configuration standardized. They need to get things, you know, their mm -hmm. arms wrapped around their network, but they failed an external audit, which really drove them to need this OS upgrades quickly. So they started with the OS upgrade as the primary problem. And this is something that Glueware, interestingly, is actually quite good at. We'll talk on that in a minute. But then an external audit was done, and then suddenly it was about configuration management. And then I think it did it lead into fixing the configuration issues? Because I'm pretty sure they would have found some problems. Yeah, it absolutely did. So they, they started out with the OS upgrades, and then once they've got things up to a certain firmware level, then started working on those configurations, right? Right. So you were able to use the Glueware on – and this – on the existing technology that was in the network. So this is a range of old and new equipment. It's what's in place. You weren't actually sort of saying, yeah, you have to go in and throw it all out and start all over again because we have to have API driven networking or something. Glueware is actually able to work with what's in place. Yeah, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. So so they had, um, this was really what we were focused on initially was all Cisco, but they yeah. had all kinds of Cisco platforms, right? Old, new, mm -hmm. whatever, different levels. So, it, you know, it's, it's normally a, a large challenge. So that's what we started with. And they did a POC. And how, would, how did that POC program go? Did they, were they successful off the bat or was it a bit of a challenge? Yeah, so the POC was, was really good. So they started out, like I said, in their lab, which you normally would do in a POC, and they started testing on devices, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and it was interesting enough in the POC, um, well, first of all, of all, it went really well. They started during the POC doing um, upgrades to their production network. And at, mm -hmm. the end of it, at the end of it, they started doing 20 to 50 devices per night and getting those upgrades done. So it was very, very successful. I want to see those change meetings where they got that approved because that must have been either behind someone's back or they actually had a high level of confidence, one of the two. Um, I've, I've upgraded a lot of older devices. There should have been a lot of problems. I can't believe, like immediately my instincts are saying 20 to 50 devices a night doesn't sound right. How did you address that? Yeah, no, thank you for that. So, so absolutely. So during the POC, actually the first thing that happened, um, the devices they did in the lab, they all failed. And uh, the customer obviously was like kind of upset, right? Wait a minute, these are all failing. So we took a look at the messages that came back and looked at the logs and Glueware does a ton of pre-checks and post-checks. These were failing the pre-checks, right? Mm -hmm. So pre-checks, things like um, the power, uh, I'm sorry, things like um, there's no uh, um, space left, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are, you know, supervisors that aren't good. There's no boot statements. It's on and on the things that we check. And all mm. of these things, if not fixed before you do an upgrade, would boot the device. Now, this was during... I didn't have to... Yeah, I'm yeah. really glad I didn't have to do that in Ansible because if you've got that many devices, like in a sense, I, I would have out, I'm outsourcing to Glueware the ability to know those things so I don't have to work them out in a lab or validate them, right? Right, right. And in the old days, you know, you'd have this huge list of checks and it's different for every OS, et cetera. And so we're handling that for them, right? Mm. So this was actually during the pandemic, right, when it started. And so this was, they were super happy that we were doing this because if they're, you know, if, if the device was not accessible, they, there's no guarantee they could even get into the site yeah. to go recover. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so building up that confidence first in the lab, and then again, you know, they, they didn't go all out, right? They did a couple of sites where they had different mm -hmm. devices that maybe weren't in their labs, but in production, they got permission. It turned out very successful, and they just grew from there. Now, you talked about failing the security audit. That would have mean a lot of configuration changes to rectify to meet the security requirements. I assume it was a range of things like default VLANs, SSH correct parameters, you know, all that sort of stuff. Were they able to then implement those changes in an automated way? Like you're talking 10,000 uh, 10, plus devices here, right? Right, right. There was there was multiple devices. Um, and, and, and absolutely. So we started out getting the firmware up to date. And then we started addressing those configuration issues where they needed it, right? So we had the standards built in our config mm -hmm. modeling. They were able to then go ahead and, you know, 
push it out to their network and upgrade what needed it and think some things were fine some things weren't it was a whole whole mesh at the end of it right all of the all of the configurations were were standardized I'm still kind of boggled about the idea of upgrading 10,000 plus devices reliably without in the middle of COVID. That sort of freaks me out a little bit, but I, I sh you know, they must have had a high level of confidence. Um, was it flawless? Did it work every single time or did it require some sort of intervention? Yeah, no. Um, anybody who's done OS upgrades <laughs> would understand that things are not flawless, right? Mm -hmm. So we we do a lot well. We have a huge library, you know, of of uh, cases uh, where we've upgraded things. But there's always that corner case where something, mm -hmm. you know, something's a little bit different about your OS version or a little bit different about your configuration. So we did come across a few of those. But what yeah. happened is we very quickly updated our package and you know delivered it to them, typically before the next change window. And then once we upgraded that package, you know, we just said, go ahead and install that and try it again. Things were run and th they were super happy because we were so right. responsive and quick to do it. And here's the kicker. The best thing about that is that all of our other customers also got those package updates. So, you know, if they were the first one to get that particular side thing that happened, all the mm -hmm. other customers would also get it. That means I don't have to keep reinventing the wheel or as I call it, artisanal automation. I'm not hand carving a piece of artisanal automation of a device upgrade. Um, now that the product's in place, now it is, this is installed on site, so you don't have to you know, give away access to the cloud and go through a whole security audit. So that must have made it a lot quicker. But now that you've got this tool in that's talking to all of the configuration, are they able to use it for other things? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you know, immediately, well, first we had to do the inventory, which was very quick. It was like a couple of hours. We got their entire inventory. Then we did the OS upgrades, and then immediately they started fixing their configurations. They have audits in place now, right? The formal audits to internal to make sure that they're, they're staying on those standards. And Drift, Drift is a big thing. So they mm -hmm. are watching immediately to see if any changes are made. Uh, they look, they compare that to their change records to see if it's mm -hmm. done within the change window or not. Um, you know, and they can address any issues they have. They do have a lot of technicians. They were used to doing a lot of things manually. Um, and they had some older automation as well that, uh, that mm -hmm. they have since replaced. Um, did they have any existing tools in place that weren't able to do this particularly? Or are they, you know, what were they using before? And, and has this replaced anything? Yeah, so they did have some legacy NCCM, and that's what I was saying. They've, they've actually um, replaced that completely, and they mm -hmm. also were using some open source tools that we, you know, that we have replaced, things like um, Ad Hoc Query. So mm -hmm. while they were doing this project, there was a separate project they were doing, and they were upgrading their SD-WAN devices, right? And at some point, they realized that there was some incompatibility with their, you know, with their GBEX or their SFPs, and so they were able to really quickly, they're like, oh, we have this new utility with Glueware, let's try it, right? So they were mm -hmm. able to, to, to type in a couple of commands and they got the entire list of all the SFPs, where they were at, what interfaces they were on, so they knew what they needed to replace. And I'm guessing that, you know, because Glueware can actually be an API target for itself, they're probably starting to write code against Glueware as a tool to do more automations, like sideways automations. You're, you're absolutely right. So what they've done is they started using our Glue API to start mm -hmm. uh, in, integrating with their other automation projects that they have in place. So the external automation, they're using that, they're pulling drift information, they're pulling different information from our database. It's working really well. And then once they go to our network RPA, which I'm sure you'll hear about more today, mm -hmm. um, they will, you know, they will actually speed that process up quite a bit. Yeah. RPA is much more to do with orchestration. That's stringing together multiple tasks. What we've been talking about is automating upgrades, getting configuration management, security compliance with the product. Um, and what we've been talking about here is a large financial customer who deployed Glueware during COVID, by the way, uh, to address audit and security issues and then quickly moved into software updates and configuration management. So thanks very much, Julia, for coming on today. Let's pause as we transition to talking with another cust another Glueware customer. In this case, it's AdviseX. They are a reseller and they are going to be talking about how they've been delivering security audits to customers. That's coming right up in about 20 seconds. Stand by. <laughs> 